So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to David Brinker and he's gonna give his presentation. And thanks everybody for showing up tonight. Uh, what I'm gonna do is introduce you to Project Owlnet, how it uh, grew to be where it is today and how it relates to um, Coast of Maine and particularly uh, Petite Manon Point. So as a little bit of an introduction, I'm kind of a not, uh, an anomaly on the East Coast because I was educated in the state of Wisconsin by a fair number of uh, professors who were either first generation or second generation descendants of Aldo Leopold's philosophy. So I come in with a, a little different perspective than most people on the East Coast and uh, come into it with a real focus on amateurs contributing to ornithology. A um, couple good books that if you want to learn more about how to sit there and uh, contribute to science, uh, one which is older than I am actually is uh, Joe Hickey's Guide to Bird Watching, which puts a real good perspective on how you can do things beyond just listing. And then to really understand the sort of uh, philosophy of folks that came out of the Wisconsin School of uh, Raptor uh, Banding and Research, you, you should really read Birding with a Purpose by Francis Hammerstrom. It's a great read by one of all the, well, in fact, Aldo Leopold's only female graduate student. She went on to uh, save the prairie chickens uh, in uh, Wisconsin, central Wisconsin with her husband. And it was uh, the two of them that really are responsible for the fact that we still have prairie chickens. And uh, one of the things that uh, comes out of that book is the definition of the word gaboons. And Fran, um, dedicated the book to gaboons, which are all the helpers, the people who uh, really just take their free time to go understand things about birds, band birds. Um, it's a, a really fun book to read because it's stories. It's stories of doing field work, stories that don't often get recorded and retold to people. Um, so let, let's jump into Saw What Owls here. And uh, I'd like to uh, start an introduction with uh, many people sit there and think solid owls are rare, especially if you go back 20 or 30 years before Project Owlnet was started. And uh, now from what we've learned, the better way to cast that is solid owls are not rare. They are a rarely seen owl. They're probably as abundant in the continent here as something like a sharp shin hawk. So uh, they're, they're not particularly uncommon. They're just really difficult to find. And as a scientist, you know, we often try and tell ourselves we need to stay detached from our subjects so that we can be objective. And uh, my two kids taught me that with sawwood owls, you just can't do that because they both would sit there and dad, say, dad, they're so cute. And uh, I often say, you know, solid owls have an undescribed virus called the cute virus. You get uh, an opportunity to work with them, you catch it, and you can never get away from your intrigue and desire to, to work with this species and learn more about it. So it is okay when you see pictures of solids to think that they're cute, and it just makes it a little bit more of a challenge to be objective and, and play the science end of this. So as some background for if you're not familiar with the sawwood owl, they're cavity nesters. They're not primary cavity excavators. So they depend on other birds like uh, affiliated woodpeckers and flickers primarily to create the cavities that they breed in. They'll also breed in um, broken off limbs where the limb might uh, decay into the, the bowl of the tree and create a cavity. But without uh, old decaying trees that somehow get cavities in them, they would have nowhere to, to nest. Um, you can sit there and build nest boxes for them and be very effective at uh, augmenting the cavity supply in a woods. And it's often a way that we use to study the breeding behavior of sawwood owls. Uh, I've had folks put 
the nest boxes in the high country of Maryland and West Virginia so we could better understand the breeding population down here. Up in Maine, uh, if you watch the Maine Natural History Observatory's webpage, you'll see that they have a nest box program, which started out working on kestrels, but the boxes are the right size and the holes are the right size, so they can also work for small owls, particularly sawwood owls. It might be a little harder for a screech owl to use the, the box with the diameter hole that it has. So go to their website if you want to see uh, about uh, potentially cooperating or collaborating with the Maine Natural History Observatory to uh, put up nest boxes for sawwood owls. Um, as a predator, their prey is primarily small rodents, uh, particularly whitefoot mice and uh, redback voles. They're also extremely good at capturing shrews. And sometimes one of the best ways to uh, document red shrews is to open up sawwood owl pellets because they seem to be very good at finding shrews. And uh, when we started opening pellets at a station one year, we found that there were far more pygmy shrews out there and leaf shrews than uh, we had any idea. They are a boreal breeder, uh, primarily in the northern forests and the boreal forests across Canada. Uh, they do breed a little bit further south along other parts of the continent. You look at this map here and it's colored green on the map. It is a forest ecosystem that is potential breeding habitat for solid owls. So in the east, you see they come down the spine of the Appalachian Mountains into southern West Virginia and actually go a little bit further south into the Great Smoky Mountains all the way across Canada from Labrador into uh, central Alaska, down the Rocky Mountains, and even in the high elevations of the mountains in Mexico where you have coniferous forests. So that's probably the most detailed approximation that you could find of the breeding range of solid owls in North America. So why are we interested in them? Well, you know, the boreal forest is home to about a third of uh, the land birds that breed in North America. They spread out across Canada. They take advantage of abundant in insects in long days to reproduce and then go south for the, uh, the winter time. And uh, Canada realized the, the prime importance of the boreal forest and has been working more and more to implement conservation initiatives across the boreal because they're responsible for the North American part of it. Um, but it's not a secure ecosystem. There's lots of work going on in the boreal forest, lots of resource extraction everywhere from oil and gas to paper products. Um, it's not like you go up there and it's as big a wilderness as you might think anymore. Uh, the change up there is fairly rapid. Um, so when you look at this, this at one time was one of the largest impact forest areas in the world going across the northern part of uh, the Western hemisphere here. And you look at the edges of that map and you can see how the light green and the dark green get interspersed. You know, the, uh, the southern parts uh, have been uh, seriously uh, worked on with uh, timber harvest uh, that changes the system. It doesn't take it out of forestry. It doesn't remove it from that. But it's not the same as what it had been for you know, the couple hundred years uh, ago. Uh, forest land across Canada is often being harvested at very high rates. We're using those forest products for paper, uh, for fuel, for uh, power plants to replace uh, fossil fuels. And so uh, the change up there is fairly rapid and fairly uh, impressive if you go up into the boreal forest. Roughly 80% of the forest products in Canada end up being exported down to the United States, whether it's for construction grade timber, paper products, um, even things like junk mail and magazines that still show up in our mailboxes. Um, 
So that's one of the threats that you, you might have to think about if you're trying to figure out how good are solid owl populations doing in the continent. Then we'll add something else to this, and it's a, a pair of invasive pests. Uh, if you've heard of hemlock woolly adelgid or balsam adelgid, those two critters uh, came over from the Orient, and um, they are impacting some important coniferous trees in our, our northern ecosystems. Uh, hemlocks south of Canada are, are keystone species and are seriously being uh, impacted by adelgids. And if you go all the way down to North Carolina, someplace like Mount Mitchell, uh, here's a 1969 photo looking north along the spine there. And you can see all the red spruce uh, and it looks rather healthy. The parking lot for the observatory is in the background. And when balsam woolly adelgid hit those high elevation forests in North Carolina, they ended up looking like this by 20 years later. Most of the mature trees were dead. The adelgids, between the adelgids and acid rain issues, there was a lot of change and damage to high elevation conifer forests along the backbone of, of the Appalachian Mountains. And folks that worked on sawwet owls in that ecosystem were fairly concerned that this change uh, wouldn't spell good news for northern sawwet owls. Well, if you go down there now, it, it looks a little bit better. Uh, a lot of the young trees have recovered. You can still see some of the old snags in the background. Um, so things are a little bit better down there. Um, but that doesn't mean risks to species that breed in high elevations in the Southern Appalachians, like the sawwet owl is over. Because if you plot out the breeding range of the sawwet owl in the, the central Appalachians here from Pennsylvania down to North Carolina, it happens to overlie the darker blues in that map of uh, basically the climate of the high elevations. Sawwet owls breed in cool forests. They cannot um, sustain themselves in places where you have 30 to 60 or more days above 90 degrees in a year. It just gets too hot for them. They lose the ability to thermoregulate. There was a very nice study done at the University of Michigan in the late 1960s about the thermoregulatory capabilities of small owls. And they found that solid owls just cannot thermoregulate when the ambient temperature gets much above 100 degrees. And when you're on the coastal plain of North Carolina or um, Virginia nowadays, uh, 100 degree days are regular during many of the summers with what we're seeing for climate change here. So there's real concern much further south in Maine here that is the climate changes that the sawwets that breed in those high elevation and Appalachian mountain forests are going to begin to retreat northward and the populations will wink out. If you take it a little further, this is a map from the U.S. Forest Service of forest type. And the important thing to look at is across New York, all of New England, where you have maple beach birch forests in 2000, and then spruce fir forests in Maine. That's what we have now. That can be used as breeding habitat by solid owls in the state of Maine and throughout New England and Pennsylvania down to the, that neck of the woods. What the Forest Service researchers here did, looked at the conditions that trees need to uh, reseed themselves and grow, which is the trickiest time for a, a tree is when that seed is germinating and growing the first few years. And they took climate projections out to uh, 2100. So 100, you know, not 100, 80 years from now, what are we going to see for forest communities in the Eastern United States? And their predictions are going to, are for a considerable amount of change. All the maple beech birch forests of New England and New York and Pennsylvania will have evolved into oak hickory forests like we have in the central and southern Appalachians. And that wonderful spruce fir forest that you're blessed with up in Maine, um, it's not gonna be there anymore. 
It's going to change to something that's more like an oak pine forest. How will that impact sawwits? Uh, we're going to have to wait and see, but I suspect it means you'll see much further range retraction to this little critter as we get further and further into the uh, 21st century here. So what's all that have to do with Project Element? And it has to do with the fact that there's, we need a way to monitor the populations of sawwit owls and figure out whether it's stable, increasing or decreasing, figure out where it's healthy and where uh, it's not so healthy. And there is really, prior to what we started here, no good way to monitor solid owl population trends. If you look at how breeding birds are monitored, the primary way that non-game breeding birds are monitored in North America is, America is the North American Breeding Bird Survey. It's been going since the 1960s. It's the primary data set that we have to track uh, bird population changes. If a year or two ago, you heard about the fact that we've lost 3 billion birds, a lot of that was based on changes and data that was produced by the, the Breeding Bird Survey. So let's take a close look at how that might work for owls. You know, and it has some pretty severe limitations, primarily secretive species, species you don't detect very often, aren't well monitored by the Breeding Bird Survey. Uh, the Breeding Bird Survey is conducted at dawn. Well, solid owls are an owl. They do their calling and their courting at night. So it doesn't work very well for nocturnal species. Um, something like a solid owl is breeding is influenced by prey population density. So you have a lot of variation from year to year that's hard to detect, which uh, makes the, the numbers game a little bit more difficult. And then finally, a significant portion of the breeding range of solid owls is beyond the limits of the breeding bird survey, basically because they breed north of where people tend to occur. So I'm gonna pop up a map here, shows that same uh, northern forest in the light green, boreal forest in the darker greens across the northern half of the continent here. And I'm gonna drop on the a bunch of yellow dots that are the points where the breeding bird survey occurs and notice the real scarcity of points up in the true boreal forest, that dark green. There's not enough points up there to do any real serious population monitoring for something like a solid owl. So we're left with uh, no real good way to do it because the Canadians have been working hard to understand the changes in bird populations in the boreal they've come up with a migration monitoring network where they use standardized banding at the bird observatories or bird banding stations to track the populations of songbirds. And uh, we're taking that concept and gonna move it into using the same process for monitoring Northern solid owls. The Canadians have also led the way in creating some guidelines for monitoring nocturnal birds, primarily owls across Canada. And they jumped into it, and got a lot of citizen science type volunteers to go out and run playback surveys or, or call surveys for breeding owls across Ontario and Manitoba. And this gives you an idea of where the points are located. Um, just to show you that they got a pretty good sample. And uh, they do though face some challenges because solid owls breed very early. Uh, they're doing their calling in March. And uh, in March down here in Maryland, where I'm from, we don't have snow anymore. Uh, up in uh, central Maine, I'll bet you a lot of places in March, you better have a snow machine if you're gonna go out and do some surveys like this because if you have to get off of a plowed road to do your survey route, uh, you're gonna have to deal with snow in that time period. It's worked rather well in the Canadians and they've taken these points and developed uh, trend numbers for, uh, these are from 1995 through 2005 to show you the, the kind of data that they have, that they can look at what's happening with uh, 
the solid owl population. Central Ontario is the area south of the dotted line in the map up in the upper right. Northern Ontario would be the area north of the dotted line. So while they're similar, they're not exactly the same, but that's a good data source if you want to sit there and try and figure out what's happening with something like the, the saw at all. So we moved into just beyond the, the just banding birds to let's take all this work we spend out at night banding saw at owls and start putting it together as a way of doing a similar thing to the migration monitoring network that's focused on gathering data that can eventually be used to um, determine what the trends of northern solid owls are in North America. And that was really the birth of the concept for Project Owlnet back in about 1994. So a little more background here. Um, if you know owls, you'll think, well, most owls don't migrate. You know, the barred owls in the backyard and the great horned owls that I hear, they're here all year round. And that's true. Uh, the, most owls are permanent residents, uh, particularly the forest owls that we're familiar with in places like coastal Maine and interior Maine. But um, it was all the way back in 1911 when ornithologists uh, started to realize that not all owls were permanent residents. A couple of biologists, uh, one from the Royal Mount Museum up in Toronto and another who was just a, a bird fanatic who would go out and do bird watching. And he was walking on the shore of, I think it was Lake, Lake Ontario after a winter or spring, spring no, a fall storm. And he was recording all the dead birds that got forced into the lake by this really severe storm that had come through. And you know, there were gulls and there were songbirds, but really what struck uh, Swales uh, as unusual was the number of solid owls that he found washed up on the beach. And the conclusion that they put together was that these birds had to have been migrating because as a permanent resident, they wouldn't have been out over the middle of the lake getting caught in the storm and forced down into the water. So all the way back in 1911, the ornithological community had the idea that sawwits moved about during the fall and could probably be true migration. Then you go into the Midwest and raptor banders along the west shore of Lake Michigan. Helmut Mueller and Dan Berger used to run a banding station at Cedar Grove. And they got the idea one night that they could get a little bit more sleep if they left their nets open at the banding station and just went around right after dusk and released any songbirds that might've gotten caught in their raptor nets. And raptor nets really aren't very good at, at catching songbirds. So there was not much risk and they periodically would have to let a thrush or something go, but then they could go to get a little bit more sleep in the morning and get up and just start observing and trapping hawks without having to run around opening all their nets. Well, what they found is uh, surprise packages in their nets some mornings in the fall when they'd get up and there'd be solid owls hanging in the nets. And after about three years of doing this, they realized that sawwits were migratory. It took them a while to dig up travelers and swales as paper, but they wrote a little paper in 1967 about, you know, solid owls being migratory and you can actually effectively misnet them by running nets uh, during fall migration. So that was the beginning of solid owl banding, roughly in the, the mid to late 1960s. We all have mentors, we all learn from someone. This is Tom Erdman and he's the fellow that I learned to bird band, to band birds with up in Green Bay. And he ran a, a bird banding station called the Little Ornithological, uh, Little Swamical Ornithological Station on the west shore of Green Bay. And you can see a, a little spot. Um, I don't know if my pointer shows or not, but it's at the back side of the field. And that little spot is our banding shack where we would do our raptor observation and banding from. 
and we're about a quarter to a half mile from the shore of Green Bay, depending on how high the water is that year. High, high lake levels were a quarter mile away. When the lake levels low, we're a little further back. And uh, during the mid 1980s, the lake, lake Michigan levels were really high. And Tom tells me that uh, in 1985, it was going to be his worst year ever. He was banding in hip boots because the trapping field was generally flooded. And uh, he was just sort of miserable because you're out there and you do this day after day. It's constant effort, mist netting and raptor trapping. And in his uh, mind, he uh, sat there and decided to try something. He took a, a loop tape like you would use on an old answering machine to record messages, put it in a tape player and uh, put it out at the station. And he says, I knew within an hour or two that we had found the trick to how do you ban more solid owls? You play the breeding call of a solid owl during fall. So that's where that idea was, uh, arose in the mid 80s. And at that point in time, um, there were only a handful of bird banding stations that were working on solid owls. Hawk Ridge on the western shore end of uh, Lake Superior, Whitefish Point was a, a spring site, Little Swamico on the west shore of Green Bay, Cedar Grove, just north of Milwaukee, Prince Edward Point in uh, Eastern Lake Ontario and Long Point in Lake Erie. And then Katie Duffy at Cape May had been doing it for a few years at that point as well. That was it. Those were people who were running nets in the middle of the night with no lure to try and catch and ban solid owls. And they were effective enough that they kept doing it. But then the lure came about. At that point, I was a graduate student in the University of Maryland at their lab in Frostburg, Maryland. And there's a natural area just west of there on top of the mountain that is one of the few places that tamarack is, occurs in the state of Maryland. <laughs> and we have winterberry and uh, I got into that swamp. There's a road that crosses it. And it's like, this feels like home. This feels like Northern Wisconsin where I was educated and would play and things like that. And my mind got to wondering because I missed solid owl banding at that point, if solid owls ever migrated through Western Maryland. So with a bunch of fellow graduate students who rather than going out drinking at night decided it'd be more fun to uh, increase our skills as wildlife biologists, we got together and we started banding solid owls in Finzel Swamp in Western Maryland. And uh, the local birders thought we were truly crazy. They didn't think saw what's all, you know, you're just wasting your time, but they said, well, you know, give them a chance and see what happens. By the time we had the station fully operation, we were running a net line that was about a quarter of a mile long, uh, 26 nets, double high, going back and forth across the road so that the deer and the bears could navigate around the, uh, the nets. Uh, fortunately, we never had a bear really get take out the rig. They tended to go underneath the nets and the deer found their way around without doing too much damage. But that was the start of banding solid owls down here in the mid-Atlantic. And we started using the lure because Tom told me, he says, hey, I got this great new thing. You need to do this. So after two or three years of Banding in the swamp with no lure, we uh, built a lure box and we put it out there to give it a try. Uh, we would run it off of a solar panel. This is the lure rig at Assateague, which I'll, I'll talk about in just a little bit. But then we would sit there and run that tape player all night long. And it would sit there and just go toot, toot, toot like a solid owl throughout the night. And uh, being students, we did a little test to really quantify how good the lure is. And without taking a lot of time to really deal with the graph, the multiplier for using a lure is about a factor of 10. Uh, the long-term number of owls that Tom had caught in Green Bay between 1971 and 1985 averaged about 65 owls. 
when he went to using Allure, his average number of owls per year went up to about 600. So it had that revolutionized what we do with the Sawan Owl Man. Once the word spread, we started to have new stations. A friend went to central Wisconsin. He had tried catching Sawan Owls without a lure near Stevens Point and decided it wasn't worth the effort because he didn't catch many. Well, he just had his best year ever with over 700 Sawan Owls this fall. I sat there and I moved because I got a job and I had to go downstate and I decided the best place in Maryland to try and catch solid owls was along a shoreline, like all the folks in the Great Lakes. So I went to Astig Island National Seashore and opened a station there in 1991. And then a friend from West Virginia University started teaching at Garrett College in the Western area, end of Maryland. He opened a station at the Castleman River a, a year later. So in the uh, early 90s, this is a, roughly what you had for people working on banding saw at owls in the eastern part of the country, and nobody was doing it in the West. It, it was unheard of out there. So this is where uh, I started, where Project Elmet, the idea came about. If you go visit the National Seashore, this is the way most people see it as they enter. This is the way I see it. It's dark when I do my work here. Um, and if you're from Maine and you, you hear solid owls in the woods and you've been listening to me and you're thinking boreal forest and northern forest, this is a panorama of Assateague Island near where I banned solid owls. And uh, it does not look like boreal or northern forest in any stretch of the imagination. It is a very different environment. Another one of those places where bird watchers would probably say, you're crazy. There's no owls down there. It's basically shrub scrub, uh, wax myrtle, bayberry. And then in the higher areas, you get the maritime loblolly pine forest. So very different than what you see up north. Now where I work is uh, two miles below the end of the road. So I can play my lure loud. I don't have to worry about any of the neighbors complaining that you know, you're playing a toot, toot, toot all night long and it keeps them from sleeping because they like to keep their windows open. Uh, at two miles below the end of the road, there's nobody out there but us. And the, and the little house that is now at this point, the only habitable building on Astig Island National Seashore. The uh, Park Service maintains it as a housing for researchers that need to be on the island to cut down travel time. We have been banding northern Sawitz owl, owls there since 1991. This is year 31 of our banding work down there. Um, this is what the habitat looks like. Okay, This is maritime loblolly forest. Very open, very easy to run nets through. You don't have to chop a net lane. Uh, we do a little bit of uh, trimming of the grass below the nets, but that's about it. What attracts the solid owls is the nearby wax myrtle and the tangles of greenbrier and the thickets that they can safely roost in during the daytime. And why this is a kind of thing where I start in late September and go to the first of December. And being from Wisconsin, we don't go home for Thanksgiving. We go out into this little tiny house on the island. And we have our Thanksgiving in a two room cabin or house that is now off the grid. Our heat's a wood stove. That's where we ban solid owls for these past 30 years. While this sounds idyllic, it is a barrier island. And there are these things called coastal storms. The banding site is about a half mile back from the beach. That's the road going into that uh, house you saw a few slides ago after one of our coastal storms. And in case you think, oh, he's just showing the worst puddle after that storm, this is the other end of the road looking back out towards the beach. Uh, so we do have our little bit of weather headaches that we have to uh, put up with once in a while. So we started banding in 1991 there, and uh, we're catching 30 to 70 solid owls a year until the fall of 1995, where I was training the, uh, the field assistant that year 
And we had never caught more than 10 owls in a night. And we went out early to, to see if we had an owl or two that I could teach him how to weigh and measure the birds. And we got out there and it was like, uh-oh. We thought it was going to be a good year, but we had 13 owls hanging in the first net check. So we started rapidly pulling owls and banding and keeping up with it. By the end of that night, we had banded 33 solid owls. Um, so something was going on that year. Well, there were a few other solid owl banding stations that had started. I mentioned Castleman River. A couple of really energetic young men ran a station, just two guys at Turkey Point at the north end of the Chesapeake Bay that year. They managed to ban 324. Katie Duffy at Cape May managed to ban 637. And down at Cape Charles, which is the tip of the Delmarva Peninsula at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay, they banded 1,007. At that point in time in 1995, nobody ever would have thought that owl banders could have caught and banded nearly 2,600 owls in the mid Atlantic. Um, it was an eye opener for what was going on with this population. So to try and uh, expand this effort, we started reaching out to standard bird banding operations like the Allegheny Front Bird Observatory and Powder Mill uh, in Western Pennsylvania, who had trained people that were banding songbirds all day long. And you would think they'd want to just jump at the chance to work all night long as well, banding owls. But uh, most of them was like, no, we got our hands full. So we had to come up with a way of getting more people interested in banding solid owls. And so we started the concept of Project Owlnet. And in the mid 1990s is when the internet was just taking off. The World Wide Web was growing, list servers were being created. So we started uh, putting the concept out on the World Wide Web, trying to get other people to band owls, primarily migrant sawwits, because not many of the other owl species do anything close to migration. Um, Project Owlnet is uh, founded on monitoring bird populations by counting and capturing migrants. And that was uh, summarized by Hustle and Ralph back in the 1996. And then Ricky Dunn came up with recommendations based on really what we were doing. She just took the effort to, to write them up and sort of formalize them for nocturnally migrating owls. And uh, so that's out there as well. Those are basically the standards that we refer people to other than our website. That's where we came from. Um, the essentials of a good banding station is a long-term commitment, what we call constant annual effort, where you're open most of the days when 95% of the migrants pass. That means, you know, five to seven days a week for five to six weeks during an autumn. You want to have a standardized netting protocol. You don't want to move your nets around. You don't want to change things. You want to eliminate the variability that comes from that kind of behavior. You want something that's controlled. And we promote the use of an audio lure because you get rid of the randomness of trying to put your nets in the right habitat. The lure is very attractive to the birds, produces better numbers and numbers that are easier to do your statistics with. So if you go to our website, the projectowlnet.org, you can find all the basics of what we do about and how the, the effort works. So here's a little bit of history of banding northern solid owls in North America here from 1960 through last fall. And you can see that, you know, it's gotten better and better all the time here. Mule and Berger started netting in 1961 or 62 at Cedar Grove, Wisconsin. Little Swamico and Hawk Ridge were established in 1971 and 1972. <clears throat> Tom figured out the audio lure in 1985. And from there on, you know, the roller coaster ride is going up. We really put together the concept of Project Owlnet based on 
results from folks in the Midwest where they found that they were catching each other's words because they were all using audio words. And it's like, well, that's the best way to get other people to, to catch owls. Got it on the, the website and the growth has gotten to the point where in 2012, over 25,000 solid owls were banded in that fall by a network of over a hundred solid owl banding stations across the continent. I never in my wildest dream did I think that this little effort to get people to ban solid owls would expand to the, the range it has, where they are now banding across Western Canada in the uh, most of the Western states. Uh, the only Western states without banding stations are uh, <coughs> Wyoming and Arizona. So uh, there's a lot of people working on this and there's more and more stations working at this every year. So what has this kind of done to the number of owls banded? Well, it hasn't really impacted all the other birds, but it has resulted in a tremendous number of solid owls being banded, over 359,000. Might as well say 360,000 by now, because we're into 2021. Uh, have been banded over the course of, of time here, generating 10,000 recoveries. So there's a lot of movement data out there that can help us start to answer questions. And if we can get people to put their data together, we can start to do trend analyses. The next closest owl as far as number banded is barn owls. And you can just go down the list there, you know, the, the big ones are barn owls, burrowing owls, great horned owls, screech owls, pretty obvious things. Spotted owls because of the conservation questions that need to be answered out west. Long-eared owls, barred owls, and from there it just dribbles down to uh, pretty low numbers really when you think of a, a 70, almost 70 year period. The, the second column is the number of uh, recoveries. So you can see how it varies a lot. The third right hand most column is the percent of recoveries. So solid owls, about 3% of the banded birds end up being recovered. Now, if you're a songbird bander, their recovery rates are generally less than a tenth of a percent or around a tenth of a percent. So owl banding, uh, we have a lot of envious bird banders out there because we get recoveries. We get birds going in between our stations. Um, that's why we did this. Uh, so quickly, let's you know talk about what true migration is. That's predictable twice annual movements between geographically separated breeding and non-breeding areas. This is a definition from Paul Curling. Requires significant physiological expenditures by individuals to move. So that means you know, think of things like Arctic turns that go from the Arctic to the Antarctic every winter. You got to put on body weight or I'll do a lot of foraging while you're moving. Warblers put tremendous amounts of fat on to make their body movements. Lastly, most individuals in a population move, okay? So they, they go to widely dispersed places and just about all of them do. That's a classic definition of migration. So what do we do at one of these banding stations? You know, well, we start our day when everybody else is uh, done with dinner and ready to go to bed for the evening. That's when our, our work starts as the sun goes down. And we open our nets, turn on our lure, and on a good night, catch solid owls in our mist nets. And then you got to take them out carefully and uh, you carry them back to your banding station, either in a mesh bag or a, an opaque bag. They both work equally well. Then you sit there someplace, uh, hopefully inside where you're warm. Uh, I hand a lot of credit to people who band in cold buildings with no heat or on the tailgate of their pickup truck like the guys did when they banded 300 owls at Turkey Point that year. But you uh, weigh them, measure them, put a band on them. Um, solid owl bands are size four generally. Uh, males get a size three uh, A. But if you notice those two fours, the top, of, that they're a different size, different height, turns out solid owls have a very short leg. 
And the size four band that the bird banding lab gave us was sized bigger than normal because waterfall banders were worried that green winged teal hunters or teal hunters wouldn't find the bands on the, the legs of the teal that they harvested. So they made the band taller. The normal proportions are the middle size band, but when the banding lab realized that we are banding thousands of solid owls a year, they said, well, we can, you know, make a better size band. So there is now what's called a four short that is specifically designed for people banding solid owls. One of the impacts of, of the work that we've been doing. Of course, when you weigh them, you gotta constrain them somehow. So we just slide them in a little tube here and put them on our scale. And it works really well. It keeps them from moving around and they can't back out of the tube. And then you quickly weigh them and you take them back out of your tube, measure their wings. You look and see how fat they are, trying to figure out if they're a fat, uh, fueled migrant like songbirds, which they are not. Um, we got eye color because there's eye color variation. Um, and we have to age them and eventually sex them. And when we started out, there was no good way to sex them. And because of the work we've done now, we can sex them. But if you see a young solid owl in July or early August, this is what the birds that were born during the year look like. They're what we refer to as the tan and chocolate ones. By the time they migrate south, they have lost all of that and look just like an adult. This is a, a late August bird that's uh, halfway into its adult plumage. You can see the white and uh, brown streak feathers coming in on its chest there. So by the time it migrates, all that real light tan is gone and they look just like an adult, with one exception. So if you open their wing, all their flight feathers grow in at the same time when they're a young bird. And they will have flight feathers that look like this, the same color, the same amount of wear. Um, if you get a bird that's a year and a half old in September or October, you start to see that, oh, there are dark feathers on the wing and there are light feathers. They do not replace all of their wing feathers in an annual molt. They only replace about half of it. And we have learned what patterns make sense to determine the age. So we can tell a six month old solid from a, an 18 month old solid from one that is 30 months old or older. So we establish age of the birds as we put a band on. And then we have what I refer to as the psychedelic owl effect. They have a chemical in their feathers called porphyrins that fluoresces if you expose it to ultraviolet light. And we use that to help teach people how to determine new and old feathers when they're aging them. The old feathers, the poor friends have degraded and they don't uh, fluoresce. The new feathers that were grown in the summer before, so they're only like a, two months old at, at most, fluoresce bright pink under that UV light. And when you have uh, new feathers on the outer edge of the wing and close to the body, the pattern you see here, that's an 18 month old saw at all. So once we have all that done, all the data collected, it's like, okay, time to let them go. And you would think, you know, these are wild animals and that, you know, you're gonna take them and let them go and they, they immediately fly away. Well, some of them do, but a lot of them, you can sit them on your wrist and they'll look around, they'll let their eyes adjust to the darkness now that you've brought them out of your banding station and sit there and look back at you sometimes for minutes before they flutter off into the, the air migrating further south again. So let's bring this to Maine. Now you have an idea how I got started, where we came and uh, came up here to Maine uh, a few years back to start banding solid owls at Petit Manon Point. And there had already been some solid owl banding done in Maine. There's really four other locations that have had significant efforts up at the Sunk Hayes National Wildlife Refuge near Bangor and um, Orono. Uh, there was a fellow that banded solid owls there for quite a while, but he's now in Northern Minnesota. Uh, the head of the uh, wildlife agency in Maine, she bands solid owls down at Freeport. 
There was a woman who banded solid owls at the Wells National Estuarine Research Reserve for quite a few years. And the Biodiversity Research Institute has done a lot of work banding solid owls on islands on the coast of Southern mainland. So those were the big ones. They were, all those predate me coming up to Petit Penan. So I came up there um, in 2014 to test out a new piece of technology. And I needed a place uh, where we could catch some solid owls. And Adrian Lepold was working at Petit Manon Point and someone suggested, talk to Adrian and go down there. And what we were doing is there's a new type of transmitter that we can use to uh, get movements of these birds. You really can't put on the, the high power transmitters where you can get long distance tracks like you can with snowy owls and peregrine falcons and golden eagles and things like that. But this was uh, called the nanotag. And there was a bunch of receiving stations along the coast of Maine because of work that was being done in the Gulf of Maine. And we wanted to see if these stations would work for tracking northern solid owls as they migrate. So that was why I came up in 2014 and we banded a handful of owls to test technology. Um, that technology is now related to something called MODIS that was developed by Birds Canada. It's a, a collaborative effort that's spreading across the continent. And if you want to uh, go learn more about it, go to their webpage, look up Mod uh, MODIS Wildlife Telemetry. And one of the items on their webpage is a very well done video that explains what MODIS is. I'm not gonna spend time to play the video here. Uh, I'll leave it to those of you that are interested in it, but it is something that is being used to monitor small birds, bats, and even organisms as small as monarch butterflies and green darners, a dragonfly. So it's pretty incredible technology. And I'll say a little bit more about it in a bit, in a few minutes. This is the copse of woods that we mist net our solid owls in. And that red maple right in the middle, it sort of bulges out reminiscent of a great big mushroom. That's the center of our net line, and that's where our audio lure is every fall while we're working. Uh, we run a line of mist nets along a trail that the line is six nets long, one net high, and it kind of zigzags along the trail with the lure right in the middle. And one of the things you find that most of your owls are caught in the two nets either side of the lure, and as you get further away, your capture rates go down. But those peripheral nets are very important because they tend to catch more males and they tend to catch already banded birds that uh, have learned to be savvy about the lures playing the breeding call of an owl in the fall. We have begun partnering with the Maine Natural History Observatory. They help us with uh, managing donations to the effort. This is an effort that is funded through uh, money that I set aside every year, plus uh, funds that come from the Baird Foundation. Down East Audubon is contributing. Uh, Kiefer Irwin is a big supporter who helps us with volunteers and she volunteers out there several nights a week. So we've developed a really strong working relationship with the Maine Natural History Observatory, trying to uh, move this into a sustainable development there where the migration monitoring of, of Sawitz in Down East Maine will continue for many years, hopefully. Um, once all of our uh, work with the birds is done, we let them go and we want to see where they go. You know, there's a lot of things you can learn from banding, um, but uh, it's a pretty simple operation that takes a, a lot of effort and costs you a lot of sleep. So at Petit Manon, we target northern solid owls because they're the most migratory owl that we have in eastern North America. Um, we also catch a few of these. We've been at this now seven years and we've caught nine long-eared owls. And while we may characterize solid owl migration as not well known yet, to poorly known, what happens with migratory long-eared owls is much less known. It, it's really poorly known. 
So any bird, any long year that we manage to ban is a hope that it'll get recaptured somewhere else and give us an idea what the migration patterns are. We also catch the occasional barred owl. Barred owls are not migratory generally, but when you have good years for reproduction, you have a lot of young barred owls that have to disperse. And uh, dispersing birds are sometimes at the mercy of wind patterns. And uh, when we get a year where there's been a lot of barred owls produced, we end up with a handful of dispersers that find their way out to the point. Um, and then there was the 26th of October in, in 2019, when all of a sudden one of these showed up in our net. And if you're a good birder and you're looking at that, you're gonna realize that that's not a saw at all. That is a boreal owl. And on that night, we managed to capture two boreal owls on the same night within about a half an hour of each other. Those are only the second and third boreal owls ever banded in the state of Maine. Now, in some winters, when boreal owls come out of Canada, bird watchers uh, often see boreal owls or they get encountered as road kills and turned into wildlife agencies or rehabbers, but very few have been banded. So uh, we do lure for boreal owls and we've been luring consistently for them for about four years or five years now. And it's obviously very rare because we've only ever caught two, but we're gonna continue because sooner or later, there'll be a nice movement of boreals uh, similar to what Sawitz do and we'll catch a few more than two. So in the seven years that we've been doing this, this is what our accumulation curves look like for when we start banding in mid-September and we go till about the 1st of November. Our best year was 2020 when we did 452. Our poorest year was a low year in 2017 and it was about 155, I think, if I remember the number. And you can see 2021 right here in the middle. We did pretty well this year. We were hoping to do better because we started out really strong, but we ended up with 224 this year. But I want to show you sort of some of the differences that you see from year to year here. This is 2020, you know, a very good year where the first um, 10 days we had east winds, fog, south winds, rain. Uh, weather conditions that were absolutely not conducive to uh, movement by owls or opening your nets because you don't want to put the owls at risk by netting them in inclement weather. And then we got a night where we caught 89 owls in one night. Then the weather didn't really cooperate very well. We got a few other owls and then another cold front came through and we caught 125 owls in one night. What you see here is a sort of a stair step pattern that reflects the fact that the only time that we seem to catch sawwood owls at Petit Manon is on the nights when they're actually migrating up and they get down to the coast and they have to hug that shoreline or risk getting blown out to sea. On the nights when weather conditions are not conducive or you know, just not really good, we don't catch any birds. In our typical year, you get stair steps like this from when you start banding until when you're done. And each of those stair steps is once a, a cold front comes through and we get nice uh, winds from the north and northwest that are not strong, you know, less than 15 mile an hour, preferably less than 10 miles an hour. Here's 2021. And when you scale it like this, you know, it looks like it was a really good year and it, it really started out well. The weather conditions were favorable and gentle so that we got up to 105 owls banded really quickly. And then the weather started to get more marginal. And we entered back in the, the typical stair step pattern where we got small steps. We never really got a big night. And it's kind of interesting that we did as well as we did when we had never had a night with more than 22 owls band. You put those two years on the same scale and you can see the difference in how the years played out. So what makes the years be so different? 
from year to year in the number of owls that we catch. And it's all sort of a predator prey cycle where um, it's based upon not the, the prey particularly that the sawwets eat, it's based upon the prey of the prey and that's the seeds that the white-footed mice and the red-back voles feed on because conifers do not have equal seed crops every year. About every four or five years, all the conifers are in sync. They have massive cone crops and drop a lot of seeds. So like in 2019, that's what happened. And a lot of seeds through the winter mean a lot of mites. And then the next spring when the sawwit owls breed, a lot of mice mean a lot of young sawwits are produced. And then that flight of young birds leaving the snowy, uh, boreal forest for the winter to survive are why you get a big movement like we had in 2020. And then you have a year following it where conifer crops, the cone numbers are very reduced. You don't have many uh, seeds. The mouse populations decline. You don't have many owls produced. And so you get fewer owls. So the, the swings we see from year to year are really based on the the seed crops of the conifers across the boreal forest, and then the food chain that takes advantage of them as you go up. Sawwit owls don't control mouse populations. The number of mice that are out there allow the sawwits to reproduce well in good years. So what have we learned by doing all this? You know, let's take a quicker look here, or closer look. Uh, always someone asks, you know, how long do they live? So this is a summary of the longevity of the owl species that uh, we have good data for. So things like your great horned owls, you know, they're the ones that can, when you get one that's really lucky, uh, live out to 28 years old. This is all from banding data. These are birds in the wild. These are not captive birds, zoo birds, or anything like this. And it, basically the larger owls live longer and the smaller owls don't live as long. Things like short-eared owl or hawk owl, which are pretty reasonable size owl, they're at the bottom of the list because the sample sizes for banding for them are not very good. So you haven't had the opportunity to catch you know, an old one. The number for solid owl is pretty good, nine years and five months. Um, that's a long-lived solid owl. Most of the sawwits are lucky if they make it to four or five. So it's a population that turns over pretty quickly. Uh, it's rare for you to get a, a bird that's more than six or seven years old. So there's the answer to how long do owls live for the curious out there. But let, let's look at you know what banding is, it was first used for many years ago. And it's questions like, where do they come from and where do they go? That, that is why we started banding raptors, you know, 40, 50 years ago, to answer questions about longevity and where populations originated and where they winter. So I'm going to first show you these two really well-established mid-Atlantic stations to create a pattern, and then we'll get to what we found from the main stations. So that red star is Assateague Island where I've been banding for 31 years now. And what I'm gonna show you next is where the Castleman River Station is. We're gonna look at these two and show you recoveries. Uh, this is a few years old now, but it's useful as an illustration. So we've banded over 10,000 solid owls in the state of Maryland since uh, the mid 1980s. And out of those 10,000 owls, when I did this, I only had nine recoveries that you would call traditional recoveries. Those are, oh, it got hit by a car and was found along the road. Oh, the cat left this on the doorstep. One of them was a, a bird band that uh, someone was walking a trail and caught a shiny object out of the side of his eye on the forest floor. And it was a great horned owl pellet. And the shiny object was a solid owl band in the great horned owl pellet. Um, so if you're trying to figure out where they go, and this is how you're trying to figure it out, it's really difficult and it's going to take you a long time. But because sawwit owls are 
really sort of uh, addicted to this lure and the lure works very effectively. We have over 500 live encounters of sawwood owls throughout the Eastern United States from birds that are retrapped at other banding stations. Now, some of these dots have multiple birds at them, but it gives you an idea of the dispersion that we get that way. So let's look at an individual site. Let's look at Assateague. And these are gonna be owls that were banded at Assateague and recovered at other banding stations. And basically it goes from south, southern Maine over to Long Point uh, along the North Shore of Lake Erie with a few of our birds getting recovered down at the tip of the Delmarva, mouth of the Chesapeake Bay there, tip to peak. Now, what about birds that were banded at other banding stations and show up at Assateague? Those are these yellow dots that just uh, appeared and the dispersion is pretty similar. You know, we go up to Sunkay's Meadows near Bangor and uh, over north of uh, Lake Ontario and a few inland birds in Virginia that actually made it out to the coast in subsequent years. Let's take a look at the Castleman Station the same way. Where did birds banded at Castleman River end up? It's a much wider dispersion going as far west as Hawk Ridge, as far north as Catasac on the north shore of the St. Lawrence, up to Hilliardton Marsh in eastern Ontario near the Quebec border and into Pennsylvania. If you look at birds that were banded elsewhere and then came down to uh, Castleman, it's roughly the same dispersion. Much wider, uh, not near as limited as what we found down in the coastal plain at Assateague. So let's quickly go through what we've accumulated in seven years from Petit Manon. The red dot is the banding station there. And uh, the first is what I refer to as direct recoveries. Those are birds that we band at our station that get encountered by other banders before they go back north for the uh, following breeding season. That's all these little green uh, points that showed up. Uh, one of the birds went northwest into central Maine, which is unusual. All the rest of them went uh, south along the coast to as far as central New Jersey. Then there's what we call indirect recoveries, which are birds that were banded, uh, but recovered after they had an opportunity to go back north somewhere and breed. And then they come back south and get retrapped by another one of these banders. Those are all the yellow points that just dropped in. And you can see we've gotten two of them now down into Maryland and Delaware and uh, New Jersey, one at Cape May and one up at Foreman's Branch Bird Observatory. So basically the, the birds that we're banding at Petit Manon appear to be staying to the coastal plain and going no further west than the Appalachian Mountains. Now here's where it gets rather interesting. I'm gonna show the, or add the birds that were banded elsewhere that we've recovered at Petit Manon. And our spread then gets quite a bit wider with us having retrapped the bird from as far west, west as Duluth, uh, more, a couple birds from up at Tadisac and one from the Straits of Mackinac. So we're getting good information just by doing standard bird banding uh, out on the, the point in the at Petit Manon. So let's try and put all of this together. You know, what's going on with solid owls? Well, you gotta think of it this way. This is a little bird. Birds keep their bodies at about 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, this bird feeds on redback voles and deer mice primarily and breeds in an area where the snow cover can get above your knees. And if you're 6'4", like me, and you want to walk in the woods in the wintertime, you better wear snowshoes because you're going to be punching through and going down deep. Well, where's the food for a snow, a solid owl, when you have 24 inches of snow or more that accumulates over the winter? The mice are down on the forest floor, protected from the owls by all that snow feeding on seeds and insects that they find under the snow cover. 
solid owls have to migrate in order to survive, uh, particularly the, the larger females. Males might be able to take things like chickadees and kinglets off a roost, but it seems like females move to places where the snow cover is much less. And so to survive, you have to move. So now let's think back 10,000 years and where the glaciers covered North America. And they were extensive. My home state was under an ice sheet that was perhaps a thousand feet thick at times. Uh, there were no solid owls breeding in the boreal forest where they are now because it was all ice. They were breeding south of the, the Laurentian ice shield in the southeastern United States, which is where the boreal forest moved to. So now you let 10,000 years evolve in a changing climate. And we have a ice sheet that is basically just limited to Greenland and the very Northern archipelago in the Canadian Arctic. All that ice is gone, the boreal forest has moved North. So solid owls have you know, moved about in that 10,000 year period. So let's look at North America now. Here's the map that you've seen a few times now with the forests that they breed in. And I didn't have the Great Smoky Mountains on them. But if you add the uh, Southern Appalachian Forest, uh, the Southern half of that was ice-free during the, the glacier. And that was covered with boreal and coniferous forests. And there's some genetic work out there that shows that the founding population for solid owls across the continent is the Southern Appalachian Mountains because they've never been covered and deforested by an ice sheet. So that's where they started. Then look around them and think of the other forests you have, the Southeastern Longleaf Pine Conifer Forest or Loblolly Pine Forest and the mixed forests of the Coastal Plain. All places where there's good cover to hide in from things like barred owls that like to eat solid owls. And uh, there's really not much snow cover. So if you migrate down there, you have a, a milder climate and a place where you can find lots of mice and shrews uh, on the forest floor. And you can hide in thick rhododendron or greenbrier thickets or roost in the, the longleaf pine needles where barred owls and cooper's hawks won't find you. So it makes sense that this is a, a reasonable place for the population to have evolved to use for a wintering area. So what happens is these birds migrate out of the boreal forest. On the coastal plain, they basically go, down, go southwest, east of the Appalachian Mountains, kind of what we've seen from the data from Petit Manon and Assateague. If you go to the western end of the forests of the eastern United States, you find that birds coming out of the Canadian prairie provinces and the taiga and the boreal forests there have a strong tendency to go southeast towards the uh, southeastern U.S. coniferous forests, and there are actually a fair number of band recoveries that illustrate this. If you move a little bit further west of the coastal plain into Quebec and eastern Ontario, you start to see patterns where the birds tend to just come out of the boreal forest and either use the Appalachian Mountains or sneak through the Great Lakes in southern Ontario. And there's a fair number of band recoveries that illustrate that. The hardest pathways to map out and illustrate or what happens to all the birds coming out of most of Ontario, north of what they would call Northern Ontario in the, their survey work uh, and how the birds navigate around the Great Lakes. Because even though they do cross water, they don't like to. And they tend to pile up on shorelines and find shorelines. So it's a very complicated pattern, but it leads to the birds coming to the Southeastern United States where the females bulk up and put on a lot of weight. So when they go back north, they can lay larger clutches of eggs and produce young. So one of the things that we uh, have encountered, and we all probably remember West Nile virus 20 years ago when it entered the, the continent and rapidly swept across from initially in New York, 
into the, the western parts of the U.S. In, in 2001, uh, it was entering Canada and southern and Ontario, and by 2002, it had spread across most of the, the southern provinces in Ontario. It's now all the way to the west coast. And it turns out West Nile virus is pretty hard on boreal breeding birds, things like solid owls, boreal owls, hawk owls, and has really impacted some of their populations. And the best paper that describes that was done by a bunch of veterinarians with uh, captive owls from Catherine McKeever's rehab facility in Ontario. But they put together a very good story about how West Nile virus was probably behaving in wild owl populations in Northern forest systems. So when we look at uh, the Ontario monitoring data and then Assateague Island's record of solid owls, we want to match that up and see what happens. It turns out Assateague has been really good at monitoring these four-year pulses when large numbers of solid owls come south. In 1995, we banded 333 solid owls. And then four years later, in 1999, we did almost 280. And then we expected another pulse like this in 2003. But you got to remember where West Nile virus went across the continent. And I blame West Nile virus on the fact that we did not have a strong eruption of young birds into the lower states uh, in 2003. Uh, I think it was a West Nile factor. It's hard to prove. There's no real good data set out there. This is a, a hypothesis that is probably always going to be that, just a hypothesis. But I think West Nile virus has changed solid owl populations. They have recovered their cyclic nature, but the total number out there may not be what it was pre-West Nile virus anymore. That's one of the things that we may be able to start looking at with the data set we've accumulated. So finally, uh, to quickly finish up here, I mentioned the MODA system and where we're going with the work we're doing. The Petit Manon Point Station is going to be very important because in a year or two, we're going to have a large project to put nanotags on solid owls from roughly the Midwest into Maine to try and develop better pathways and description of their pathways using the MODIS telemetry system now that it is getting built out and there's enough receivers spread across the country. Um, nanotags are a pretty impressive technology. Uh, the growth in the network has been uh, impressive. We have been working feverishly to get receiving stations throughout the uh, Northeastern United States. We now have a good network, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, and are about in a year or so to finish up uh, a similar network in New England. Uh, and uh, this is what the, the network of receiving stations looks like right now. Uh, we're gonna add about 15 or 20 more stations in New England over the next summer. And at that point, we'll pretty much be ready to uh, put nanotags on a number of solids and run them through this network to see if we can better understand things that are related to complete annual cycle. You know, where do they breed? Are they wandering uh, breeders that uh, do, are not uh, fixed to a breeding site? Basically, are they nomadic as far as breeders? Do they winter in the same areas every year or do they choose different areas? We don't have a good handle on that. And the, the MODIS network that Birds Canada has put together really could help us do that. So our next step in, in beyond continuing routine monitoring will be to set up a study design so that uh, probably in the, the summer and fall of 2023, we can start nanotagging solids to see what they do. So. Hopefully uh, you found this interesting and uh, it does relate to the coastal islands because when the birds get to the coast, you know, they have to make uh, decisions. And I want to thank all the people throughout the continent that have helped uh, make Project Owlnet a success. 
from local volunteers in Maine that help us out to people who help with nest box studies in the Appalachians, to all the banders who give up sleep uh, working from either dusk to midnight or even those other stations who go the extra effort to basically work from midnight to dawn. What we've learned about sawwood owls and the ability to start thinking about their conservation is really the product of all of these people's effort. And uh, with that, I think uh, it's probably time for whoever's managing the chat to see if there's questions.